Good morning, everybody. Good morning. And we're going to go ahead and we'll call the May 24th, 2022 uh, Palm Beach County Board of County Commissioners workshop to order. With that, I'll ask for a roll call, please. Commissioner Bernard? Here. Commissioner Kerner? Here. Commissioner Marino? Here. Commissioner McKinley? Commissioner Sachs? Here. Mayor Weinroth? <coughs> Vice Mayor Weiss? Here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we have heard from our colleagues, Commissioner um, McKinley and Mayor Weinroth, that they will not be able to join us today. Um, with that, I'm going to ask Commissioner Kerner to please lead us in our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. Thank you, Mayor. Father, guide us in the duties we're about to perform. Give us wisdom to make the best decisions for all citizens. Help us to remember that no problem is too small to escape concern and perplexity too great to resist solution. Amen. Amen. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. All right, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, ask if there are any additions, deletions, or substitutions to our agenda this morning. Vice Mayor, there are no additions, deletions, or substitutions today. Thank you. I'll take a motion for adoption. I have one from Commissioner Kerner and a second from Commissioner Marino. Thank you. All in favor, all opposed, that's approved five to zero. All right, moving on. Regular agenda on page two. Motion to uh, pass agenda item 3A1 and 2. We have a motion from Commissioner Kerner, seconded by Commissioner Marino, uh, in support of passing agenda items 3A1 and 2. All in favor? All opposed? That item also passes 5-0. Thank you. All right. Coming back, we are going to move into our workshop. And we have uh, item, one item this morning on our workshop, and that is on our storm season uh, preparedness report from our public safety division. I will turn it over to Mr. Bon Laren to introduce his uh, crew. Thank you, Vice Mayor Weiss, Commissioners, Administrator Baker. Um, we are with you this morning to share with you some of our thoughts and preparation uh, for our disaster preparedness, our storm season that's coming up, as well as dive into a little bit of some of the other responses that we've done on the emergency side, maybe not storm related, just to give you a bigger picture from an emergency management perspective of what we do um, in, that, in that particular division. It's much more than, than storm season. Um, so with me today is uh, Stephanie Shanahan, our Director of Public Safety uh, Department, and Mary Blakeney, our um, Director for the Division of Emergency Management. Um, if at all, any point at today you see um, Stephanie wince at any comments you make, it's not because of the comments. She's got a pinched nerve and she's dealing with a little bit of pain, but she, she's powering through today with us. So I just wanted you to know that, uh, that she's with us strong today. And also speaking of with us too, I also wanted to acknowledge our chiefs from Fire Rescue, Chief Kennedy, Gonzalez, Tazi, who are integral parts of our emergency response and our team, and we really appreciate their support, um, not just in our emergencies, but throughout the year. So thanks, gentlemen, for being here with us today. Um, so our agenda for the day, we'll go through uh, this PowerPoint. Um, we're going to give you a, a brief overview of emergency management of our department, what we do. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of our core hazards, not just on the storm side of things, but in some of the uh, response uh, that we do hazardous materials, uh, other natural type disasters, wildfires, and the like. Uh, we'll get into a little bit of our 2021 um, storm season, our hurricane storm season in review and give you a little bit of a preview uh, to 2022, depending how long our discussion goes at the board meeting today. We might actually get the actual predictions, which come out uh, a little bit later on uh, this morning. Uh, so we'll see how that rolls. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about our preparedness cycle, uh, what we're doing to make sure that our residents are prepared, we're prepared, you as our Board of County Commissioners are prepared, and then finally, a refresher on how you can help both our board, understanding our core, 
um, responses, understanding some of the different types of things that our policymakers and elected officials um, are able to, to do. So our Division of Emergency Management um, is a, uh, a team, and, and really it is all about teamwork at the Department of Emergency Management. Um, and we even named team, Together Emergencies Are Managed. Um, and, and, and they are. And in Palm Beach County, we have incredible partners uh, that come to the table. And as a division, our vision is to be a world-class emergency management agency keeping our community safe and resilient by working together with our partners as, and the public as a team. And I think that our emergency management department, our public, I'm sorry, division and public safety department have absolutely um, done that and have really put forth truly what it means to be a team. Um, we're also blessed to have the support and resources of all of Palm Beach County uh, to help us plan, respond, and recover from our uh, disasters. As you see on this PowerPoint, uh, there's a chart up there about our EOC activation uh, organization and how we organize ourselves when we do have an incident in Palm Beach County. Um, and we don't just rely on our departments in this particular chart. Um, we also have numerous federal, uh, state, not-for-profit not organizations, volunteer agencies that help us to prepare, respond, and recover from a lot of the major disasters that we have. And just to give you a few brief highlights on this chart, I mean, obviously, front and center at the very top is our county administrator. Our county administrator is designated and becomes our incident commander for the duration of any um, emergency activation that we have. The executive policy group of which the administrator is a part of, uh, the mayor on behalf of the Board of County Commissioners uh, serves, as well as some other key um, county staff are part of um, that executive policy group, uh, in addition to uh, the director of the Florida Department of Health and Fire Rescue Administrator, as well as the sheriff. We've organized ourselves as well into three um, different sections. We do admin finance, planning, operations, and logistics. And one thing that we do differently in Palm Beach County than many other counties across the country is our administration team is engaged at every top level in each of those different sections. Uh, you essentially have a member of the management team or administration um, heading up our planning section, admins, uh, our, our logistics and our operational support. And so it's great to have those types of decision makers in the room with our incident commander, getting that feedback so we're able to make quick decisions on the scene to be able to respond uh, quickly. And I think that many uh, counties around the state and the country are envious of the model that we put in place and the staff engagement um, that we have um, on uh, that particular issue. I'd like to turn it over to Mary Blakeney, our Director of uh, Division of Emergency Management. Thank you, Todd. Good morning, Vice Mayor, Commissioners, <coughs> Incident Commander Baker. It's so good to be here with you today. I want to start off by talking about our core hazards here in the county. Contrary to what a lot of people believe, the Division of Emergency Management, we're not just the hurricane people. There are other hazards that impact Palm Beach County each and every day. As shown with our recent results of COVID-19, as well as responses that have been around the state. For example, there was recently a tornado in Lee County, but there also was an EF0 tornado that touched down in Palm Beach Gardens on April 6th. We were very fortunate with that, but it still involved the emergency management team working through the results of that with our National Weather Service. And also incidents like what we saw, unfortunately, in Miami-Dade, the engagement of their emergency management team in the Surfside building collapse. So we spend all year addressing these 12 core hazards and their plans, which include natural hazards, technological hazards, and human-caused hazards. We plan with our stakeholders and partner agencies, training responders and county staff, and exercising our entire emergency management system. Our structure is designed around being the organizing agency for communication, coordination, and collaboration with our stakeholders. Yet, we know this time of year, it's really our opportunity to discuss the upcoming hurricane season and how our residents can be prepared for any type of disaster that may strike 
Palm Beach County. So we're gonna take time this morning to discuss what you can do and what our residents can do to be prepared. But before that, I just wanna focus a little bit on the Governor's Hurricane Conference. We are fortunate enough to have, have been the host location of the Governor's Hurricane Conference in West Palm Beach since 2017. And we will remain the host location of the Governor's Hurricane Conference through 2026. This year, the conference offered 40 training sessions, 50 workshops, a robust vendor exhibit hall, and keynote speakers from local, state, and federal agencies. The conference had over 2,400 attendees this year, many of which were from our community and included first responders, some individuals from our transportation network, school board, water utility staff, emergency management staff, and many more. The training sessions covered topics such as exercise design, design, EOC functions, mitigation for emergency managers, emergency planning, planning, management of volunteers, tropical meteorology, recovery from disasters, recovery funding, and even EOC tours, which highlighted our very own Palm Beach County EOC. The workshops were set as one and a half hour sessions of best practices and lessons learned from individuals, from organizations and agencies with real world experience. These workshops focused on debris, improving funding outcomes, disaster feeding, stress management for responders, improving coordination with energy providers, communicating through crisis, community outreach education, private sector response, and much more. In all, these training sessions and workshops were attended by representatives from three different countries, 36 states, and 65 of the 67 counties in Florida. These are all the individuals that would help aid us should we have a disaster here in Palm Beach County. So we're very excited about the turnout and activities that happened during the Governor's Hurricane Conference. But let's focus on hurricane season and our impacts. Although 2021 was forecasted to be an above average year, it spared Palm Beach County from any direct impacts, but still ended up as an above average season. It was the third most active year on record in terms of named storms. It marked the sixth consecutive above normal Atlantic hurricane season and was the first time on record that two consecutive hurricane seasons exhausted the list of 21 storm names. This year, Dr. Phil Klotzbach of Colorado State University has predicted 19 named storms, nine hurricanes, and four intense hurricanes, but it only takes one. And as Todd mentioned, we're waiting any minute to learn what the National Hurricane Center's forecast will be for this year. But regardless of the number, it just takes one, and we need to be prepared. We need to be ready to respond every day of the year, regardless of the seasonal forecast and regardless of the hazard. But I wanna share with you a little bit of information that came up during the Governor's Hurricane Conference. Dr. Ken Graham, the director of the National Hurricane Center, shared some of his agency's research, which, was felt, which we felt was important to share with you today. 16 hurricanes have made landfall in the U.S. since 2017, and seven of those were major hurricanes. Dr. Graham also shared that we have had more Category 4 and Category 5 landfalling hurricanes since 2017 than we did from 1963 <laughs> to 2016. Using this information, he also shared that just a small change in path for the storms which impacted the Gulf states, these storms could have been direct impacts on the state of Florida. The state of Florida was very lucky with these storms. It do does not take much to change a storm's direction. As we saw with Hurricane Dorian, wiggles matter, and we cannot let our guard down. Dr. Graham shared a, concer a concerning statistic as well. The nation's strongest storms, which are categorized 
150 miles per hour or greater, all but one were tropical storms three days before landfall. The average time of these storms becoming a hurricane is 50 hours before landfall. And the impacts of these storms are felt well before landfall, sometimes 12 hours in advance. This is why preparedness cannot wait. It is important for everyone to be prepared and even our responders to be ready to activate when called to do so. As we learned recently from our partners from the National Weather Service in Miami, preparedness can't wait because you will see over the past 11 years, South Florida is hurricane country. Palm Beach County has been extremely lucky, but luck often runs out. As a community, we need to encourage our residents to be ready for the unexpected and educate them about preparedness programs and basic actions they can take. On average, our emergency management staff reach over 100 people each month directly through our preparedness presentations, but this is, this is just a small number of people we directly address. We need everyone, including you, our viewers, to, that are watching today to be prepared and encourage everyone to be prepared personally and professionally. So please take every opportunity to encourage your staff, family members, friends, and your constituents to be prepared. Our message is simple, so help us spread the word. Make a plan, build a kit, be informed, and get involved. So let's discuss a little bit about making a plan. As part of your, land, your plan, you should know your zone, but also know your home. If you live in an evacuation zone and need to evacuate, know where you are going if officials order an evacuation. Preference would be to stay with family members or friends, but stay within the county. Determine how you would get there, where your meeting place for family and friends would be after the storm. Do you have a plan for your pets and your family that may have special needs? If you plan to stay home, shutter and shelter in place. <laughs> if your plan is to stay in a to shelter in place, make sure you know your home and understand when your home was built and check on any additional mitigation measures that have been taken to secure your home. For example, does your home have impact windows? Do you have shutters? Do you have roof, roof reinforcement bracing, a hurricane resistant garage door, and appropriate water drainage on your property? Also conduct an insurance checkup to ensure you have adequate coverage. Know where your important documents are located. Should you be sheltering place, understand that there are a number of indirect fatalities as a result of the hurricane. The largest number of these deaths are due to heart attacks and power problems. If you are using a generator, make sure it is maintained and operational and then kept and you keep it outside, away from exterior doors, windows, and vents, and keep it dry. These are all items to plan for when considering on making your family plan. Would you like to address a little bit, Todd? So on this particular slide, uh, we do talk about doing an insurance checkup. And we thought it might be a good opportunity as we're in day two of the special session in Tallahassee, just to give you a brief update on some of the things that the legislature is trying to do to uh, work with insurers around the state as well as property owners around the state. And I, I could just say on a personal level, I woke up two weeks ago, got an email from my insurance provider that told me that effective on June the 29th that my insurance uh, policy was being canceled. And I'm not alone, there were 58,000 other policy members um, who also got that same letter that I got just a couple of weeks ago. So here we are staring at the front end of hurricane season uh, with very few options that exist. So this issue is very real and continues to be very real to a lot of our residents uh, throughout Palm Beach County and I feel it personally. So um, we have Ed Chase and our team in Tallahassee this week 
um, working um, to uh, ensure that we can do everything we can to try to affect some of the things that are happening during the legislative session. We thank Commissioner Bernard um, several months ago at a BCC meeting. He said, please work with the legislature, see what you can do on the insurance component um, to see if there are some ways that we can effectuate some change. Um, I will tell you that two pieces of legislation have been filed during this session. One is poised uh, to pass, or both are poised to pass out of the Senate today. Uh, they're moving very quickly with the House to take those up, uh, most likely later today and tomorrow. Um, so a couple of uh, issues that they're, they're looking at in Tallahassee. One of them, and the big piece of the first bill, is the reinsurance fund. And that is creating a $2 billion reinsurance fund in the state of Florida so that insurance companies, as they are trying to insure themselves for large catastrophes, have a pretty significant pot of funding that exists that they can uh, uh, buy into uh, to help cover and mitigate any of those more catastrophic losses that they might see in the state of Florida. The second piece of that bill deals with the um, My Safe Florida Home program. Back in 2006, some of you might remember that the Florida legislature put in place a program that allowed for homeowners to uh, work with the state to get some mitigating grants, match those dollars to do some improvements on their home. So the legislature is looking at putting an additional $150 million into uh, that particular program. It will, one, allow individuals to have inspections on their homes, and two, it'll provide a pot of money that um, homeowners can uh, get grants of up to $10,000. Uh, in a two to one match. So for every dollar that a homeowner puts in, they can get two from the state up to $10,000. And that's for homes both that are insured at under $500,000 in value, as well as for low income individuals uh, by state statute, regardless of the valuation of their homes. So really looking to try again to see if there's windows, doors, garage doors, those kinds of entry points where we uh, as a state can help our residents uh, be able to go in there and do some of those particular upgrades. The other big issue that's pending out, out there is on roof damage and roof claims. And so there's two bills. There's one a part of the bigger bill and then one separate uh, just dealing with roof claims and potentially um, some of the fraud issues that we've seen over the last few years in terms of roof coverage. So the first piece of this says that essentially an insurance company can't discriminate against an individual because of age of roof, particularly if they have useful life remaining in their roofs and from denying them coverage based on that issue. So there's some specific parameters within the bill that deal specifically with that age coverage, uh, but that is something that the legislature is trying to address in the first bill. In the second bill that's pending, uh, what we saw uh, years ago was people would have damage to their roofs, uh, people would come around to inspect their properties and say, hey, can we take a look at your roof? And they say, oh yeah, you need to have a complete redo of your roof. Um, the legislature has passed legislation to try to cut down on some of that fraud, but here they're also saying in the second bill that if you have 25% roof damage and you get uh, the repairs to that, that doesn't disqualify your entire roof from being eligible from coverage going forward. It's a little complicated, but there's a 25% rule that exists in the building code today for those repairs that the legislature is trying to provide some relief to homeowners. So you don't have to get an entire roof rebuild if 60 or 70% of your roof is still in pretty good shape if you see some of those damages. And then the other piece of the first bill um, is really dealing with um, some of the, the legal cases that the legislature and the governor's office are making a claim are um, providing for increases in policies, you know, bad faith type claims, as well as limitations on certain uh, attorney's fees for contingency cases um, and the like. <clears throat> so just wanted to share with you while we had the opportunity, while we're still fresh in the moment of what the legislature is trying to do. I will tell you this, uh, Mr. Chase went up there and was been working with Pat Rutter and our building team um, prepared to address with the legislature some of the building code related issues that we've talked about previously. An amendment was filed yesterday to one of the pieces of legislation in the Senate and at, upon presentation it was ruled that that was out of order and that that was not within the call of this particular session. We 
disagree with that. We feel like that certainly it was within the call of the uh, legislative session, but that was the ruling. And so we don't expect to see <clears throat> any changes um, in building codes right now to, um, on a broader level, specifically to the Surfside incident um, and some of the issues that we've spoken. So I just wanted to share some of that immediate feedback with you, what we've seen. So. That's what we're trying to deal with on the insurance side of things. Thanks for allowing us to digress a little bit from this presentation to just give you a quick update on where the legislature is on that. Wonderful, thank you, Todd, for sharing that. <clears throat> the next phase in our preparedness is to build a kit and keep it stocked year round. Plan for five to seven day supply of shelf stable items. These are items that can remain in your pantry. This kit does not need to be expensive, and you can purchase an extra can or two each time you go to the store and keep those in your pantry. Plan for canned food and snacks. Don't forget the can opener. As for water, you should plan for one gallon per person per day. This water can be collected with existing containers with water directly from your faucets. Prescriptions and over-counter medications, flashlights, battery-powered radio and extra batteries, personal hygiene supplies, baby items, pet items, paper products and plastic utensils, and make sure you have a supply of cash and important documents like identification, insurance policy, legal documents, and pictures. Those should all be items within your disaster supply kit. Get involved. There are several ways you can get involved with community preparedness, response, and recovery. Volunteer with community groups in your community to check on your neighbors. With so many new people moving to the county, get to know your neighbors and educate them about preparedness, especially if they've never lived in a community that could be impacted by a hurricane. Some things you can do to help your neighbors is collect supplies for emergency kits, help them install their shutters, or help them evacuate if told to do so. After a storm, check on your neighbors that may be living alone or that are elderly. And many, and many may need assistance. You can help them by assisting with removing shutters, sharing supplies and resources, and clearing debris from their yard. This past weekend, we had a very robust um, training exercise drill at the South County Civic Center with some of our um, community emergency response team leaders. The CERT team is a, a perfect way to get involved in your own individual community. So we encourage individuals to check into getting involved with the CERT program. And also to be informed. Signing up for Alert PBC, downloading our Palm Beach County DART app, monitoring local media, our website, and our social media for preparedness information and protective actions. Our website, readypbc.com, is filled with valuable resources on preparedness information and tips. This information is available to anyone and everyone who would like to share these preparedness messages with their family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. This past year, our website had over 46,000 visits, and we had over 1 million connections through our social media platforms. Palm Beach County also has a system in place called Alert PBC, which allows you to opt in to receive public safety notifications via phone calls, text messages, or emails. Alert PBC allows us to alert you of a public safety issue in your community, such as hazardous weather conditions. When we use the notifications about potential safety health a safety hazard or, or concerns, you will receive a message via voice, text, or email communications that you choose to receive. This information you provide is protected and will not be used for any other purpose. Residents can sign up for this free service by, by visiting alertpbc.com. Last year, more than 1,300 residents registered for Alert PBC. In total, we sent out vital information 50 times to a total of more than 1.3 million contact numbers. In addition to our website, we have a convenient phone app called PBC Dart. PBC Dart provides valuable information and resources at your fingertips. This smartphone application has evacuation zones, shelter open and closed status, damage assessment information, and many other features to help you before, during, and after a disaster. 
All of the previous preparedness information is great to prepare you for a storm and guide you if you're advised to evacuate. So why do we evacuate? To clarify why we have issue evacuation orders is we issue evacuations due to anticipated storm surge. Storm surge is the rising coastal water associated with tropical cyclones. Storm surge is the abnormal rise of water beyond that of high tide, which is pushed by the storm toward the shore and piles up along the coast. This rise in water can cause extreme flooding in coastal areas, particularly when storm surge coincides with normal high tides, resulting in storm tides which could reach six to nine feet in Palm Beach County. Most casualties during tropical cyclones occur as a result of storm surge. So contrary to popular belief, we evacuate the coastal regions for storm surge, not because of high wind speeds. In general, high winds do not lead to casualties and storms. Rather, nearly half of all fatalities attributed to cyclones are caused by storm surge. This is why we say, hide from the wind, run from the water. And, and so just the photos that uh, we've put up there for you on this particular PowerPoint, we thought uh, really did a nice job in illustrating just understanding low tide, mean sea level, high tide, as well as storm, what storm surge means in our coastal areas, and really emphasizing, again, what Mary said, why we evacuate. Oftentimes, it's, most of the time, it's because of that particular storm surge, and you see how that can rise um, in those particular um, pictographs. So what we have done is based on track intensity and its expected surge on an approaching storm, we have the ability to select which evacuation zones are ordered to evacuate. Palm Beach County has six evacuation zones. Zone A consists of residents living within manufactured mobile homes, those who have substandard construction. For an example, if someone knows their roof is currently compromised, they may want to evacuate and those who live in flood prone areas. Zone B through E are coastal areas or are areas impacted by inland flooding due to storm surge being pushed into inland waterways. And zone L is located around Lake Okeechobee and would be evacuated in the event there would be models forecasting overtopping of water over the Herbert Hoover Dyke surrounding the lake. We have the ability to open a total of 15 general population risk shelters, two special needs shelter locations, and two pet friendly shelters. Our residents should listen to announcements for shelter opening as all shelters may not be opened. Special needs shelters are for residents with certain medical conditions. These shelters require residents to pre-register as well as have a caregiver. To register, residents can complete an application online at readypbc.com or contact emergency management at 561-712-6400. For residents required to evacuate who have a pet, they can pre-register for the pet friendly shelter directly through Palm Beach County Animal Care and Control's website or visit readypbc.com for more information. Even with robust preparedness measures, our residents rely on us for emergency shelters as well as other countywide disaster functions that are a critical component to our emergency response system. The Employee Disaster Response Program, also known as EDRP, assists in identifying county employees and their skill sets and matching them with disaster related roles. The EDRP can be used for any type of hazard or emergency and provides clear assignments and training to our employees. The breakdown of county employees is shown on the table on the screen. While we have over 3,900 employees with department-specific disaster responsibilities as part of their job, we currently have close to 1,400 employees enrolled and trained in our community in a variety of disaster essential roles. 
Within the EDRP program, Department of Central Staff continue to have a vital disaster responsibility. Some examples of Department of Central Staff includes roles like water utility plant operators who maintain critical water utilities operations before, during, and after a storm has passed. Fire rescue staff who continue to respond until it is no longer safe to do so and then resume operations immediately after the winds subside. Facilities development staff who prepare our county facilities, facilities for the approaching storm, ensure critical systems are operational during the storm and immediately conduct damage assessment after the storm. Planning, zoning, and building staff who are staged and ready to conduct immediate damage assessments when safe to do so. And engineering staff conducting what we call the initial first push of debris from our roads ensuring bridges are operational, and resuming operations of our countywide traffic signals. For shelter staffing, we currently have 67 shelter supervisors and 595 shelter support staff. The diagram to the right of the screen shows the organizational structure in place for supporting general population shelters. Sheltering does not just involve county staff. Other agencies, such as the Healthcare District, the Department of Health in Palm Beach County, Palm Beach County School District, and Palm Beach County and Municipal Fire Rescue Agencies are assigned to fill vital shelter roles as well. It is a countywide team effort to ensure our community is safe in times of disaster. We've been preparing during non-hurricane season through our planning, training, and exercise period. As part of our plan, train, exercise, and evaluate cycle, the Division of Emergency Manage Management has sponsored or conducted more than 26 training classes, having trained over 1,000 students in courses such as CERT, Teen CERT, which is now really tapping into the next generation of our community. We're very excited this year about bringing Teen CERT back into our community. Mass fatality incident response, emergency planning, intermediate EOC functions, shelter operations training, and incident command training. In addition to our sponsored training courses, we encourage all community partners to participate in various FEMA independent study courses online, which has contributed to 86% of our EOC having completed basic national incident management system training courses. That's our highest percentage ever. Additionally, we have conducted six exercises attended by more than 300 participants, including a FEMA-evaluated EOC exercise, a FEMA-evaluated field-based exercise, community emergency response team field drill, a domestic security tabletop exercise, and a municipal flood exercise. In addition to exercising locally developed plans, we regularly convene with emergency managers around the state through conference calls, webinars, statewide or regional meetings, or by attending conferences such as the Governor's Hurricanes Conference to discuss lessons learned and best practices implemented statewide. I will now turn it back over to Todd. Thank you, Mary. So we often ask ourselves, um, how can I help? And I know that a number of you on the Board of County Commissioners are always on the phone with our incident commanders, the rest of our administrative team during some of our activations and storms and in constant communication. Um, and I'd also want to point out, you know, people like Richard Radcliffe that we have here with us, one of our municipal partners, in just the intense communications that we engage in with our municipal partners, making sure that um, they're getting the same information that we're providing to you as um, our administrator and incident commander is making uh, those decisions as we go um, along. So let's kind of take a quick moment to dive in about some of the things that we can do um, in our respective roles to help. And first off is just understanding our response priorities and understanding our, our, our responsibilities during that. The, the first priority uh, is when you have an incident, um, you are in life-saving, life safety, and security mode. Um, it is our immediate goal to make sure that affected areas, that we have the right teams in those areas that we're looking for life 
and we're looking to secure those particular areas, making sure that individuals are accounted for. These are not only just high hazard areas, but these are high risk populations that many of you have um, in your respective um, districts. And also when we engage in some search and, um, and rescue type situations and operations. Our second priority that we uh, come under is that of establishing communications. And communication is incredibly important whenever you have a particular incident. I mean, it's as, uh, sometimes as basic as the first push that Mary talks about when our teams are out there on the streets calling back in and, and dialing in and our, and our public is dialing in some of the things that they're seeing on the ground so that we understand that what, that what that is. It's also establishing some of those landline communications that we have as well and making sure that we're in touch with the appropriate officials at the right time uh, so they know what the current situation is um, on the ground as well. Our third priority uh, for our response are mission critical operations. These are sort of just, you know, some of your basic human needs. Um, hospitals, you know, what situation is our hospital in? Our first responders, fire, EMS, police, making sure that those operations are up and going and running and that they're able to respond because obviously those are some of the first on the ground and first to respond uh, when we have life safety issues. Um, the other becomes part, priority number four, and that's mission-critical infrastructure. So aside from just opening roads and schools and businesses, a lot of this is also uh, water treatment, lift stations, making sure that those types of facilities are operating. Oftentimes when you lose power, uh, lift stations become integral into the uh, fabric of getting those water systems back so we can flow um, you know, wastewater as well as provide uh, drinking water. And then finally, our environmental hazard mitigation, our fifth uh, priority. Uh, this is uh, when we look at, you know, sewage leaks or wells maybe being contaminated and making sure that we have um, uh, an understanding of those particular um, situations. I didn't mention debris uh, in this particular list, and while debris is very important, um, it's not one of our number one priorities. I mean, we certainly get out there and we move debris to the side of the roads, but one, one message that we wanted to leave for our public as well when it comes to that issue, because it comes up quite often, and that is as you are putting debris out and clearing debris, um, to make sure that you keep that separate. You keep your debris separate from some of your garbage. I know Solid Waste Authority uh, is gonna thank us very much for this message, but that is something that gets commingled oftentimes and makes it a lot more difficult on the recovery side of things. So that was just one message that we wanted to carry forward. Um, we also are looking specifically to you, our policy uh, makers here, as well as many of our other elected officials, both from our state and federal delegations who we work closely with, um, to reinforce some of the EOC actions and some of these priorities that we're working on. Um, obviously, even before we get to the federal declarations, it usually starts with the state. And oftentimes it's convincing the governor and officials um, it, at the Division of Emergency Management uh, that there is an issue on the ground and that those declarations need to be carried up to the federal government. Oftentimes you need to convince the state first uh, as the first step before you get up uh, to the federal declarations. So getting those early state declarations that then lead to some of those federal declarations, and that allows us to work with some of our lawmakers to essentially turn on um, some of the FEMA uh, programs. Um, also, you know, special requests that we have for, for different federal assistance. I mean, some of the lessons learned when we look at Surfside, um, you know, you had a lot of state and federal engagement, particularly from some of the federal uh, officials who were quickly on the ground, boots on the ground, and giving some messaging like, you know, on, in, the, in that particular circumstance where some of those units were uh, Fannie Mae uh, covered uh, mortgages in trying to get the message to those individuals about payments on those homes and suspension of those kinds of, of payments while they worked through that particular disaster so those families wouldn't have to worry about uh, that particular situation they were in. And then also uh, reimbursement support. Um, one thing that you find during um, disasters, response and recovery is that they're not cheap, they're expensive. And we expend a considerable amount of money doing that. 
Um, I know that you know we like to say, oh well, we don't want to worry about how much it costs when we're responding to these things, but but we do, and and we're very mindful of that, you know, at the emergency operations center. But we're also mindful of the fact that we need to get in there. Uh, we're doing some very very uh, specific uh, responses um, that that do cost money, and that federal support for those reimbursements is important. And then also consistent messaging. And um, thank you to so many of you who are engaged with us in press conferences and getting that messaging out. Um, your social media is vital uh, to getting some of that communication to a lot of folks that might not see things on television or, or read it in print media. Um, there's a lot of different ways that we communicate that. Uh, you are all lifelines, um, being the head of your respective districts and having uh, folks that follow you very closely. That consistent messaging that you put out um, is so important, not only to reinforce the protective actions that we're asking of our residents to take uh, on the front end of a storm during it and afterwards, but also just to continue to reinforce some of the public messaging and the public information uh, that we are putting um, out there time and time again. And then uh, just to wrap things up uh, a little bit before we get into some of your questions, we clearly are hoping for a quiet 2022 uh, storm season. And, um, but, but you know, the one thing that we wanted to, to make sure that you knew is that we prepare every year for every storm season like it's going to be a difficult one. Um, we prepare for the worst, we pray for the best, and I can tell you that your uh, public safety team, your emergency management team, your fire rescue team, your administrative team, um, and, and everywhere else is prepared and understands what it takes um, to respond to this, to develop strategies every day, to make sure that we're storm ready, to make sure that we are emergency um, ready. And, and just finally, I wanted to again thank um, uh, some of our key, key components and staff that are part of this response. Obviously, our incident commander, Administrator Baker, over um, those details, but um, getting to some of those particular uh, section leaders, Patrick Rudder, who uh, serves as our logistics chief, Sherry Brown, who serves as our administration and finance chief, um, Reggie Duran, who, and, and also Dort Miller, who both serve as our operations um, policy chiefs um, in that setting. I mean, these are the folks that are vital to a lot of the responses that we get from the public and needs that we get from the public in seeing that uh, some of those needs get met in our community. So I wanna thank you for your time today and uh, we are happy to answer any questions that you might have, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, I'd like to um, open this up. I see, um, did you have comments? Um, Administrator Baker had comments and then we'll move to Commissioner Marino. Just want to also highlight the fact that we work very, very closely with the Sheriff's Office along with uh, other law enforcement throughout the county. Our chiefs of police uh, work very closely. <coughs> we have phone calls with them on a regular basis. We also have uh, FDLE along with other law enforcement, the highway patrol, et cetera within the EOC that come, we're in constant contact with them as well. Uh, the League of Cities, Richard has to sit in the EOC with us the entire time and we have uh, weekly calls, sometimes daily calls with the cities. Uh, I want our community to be well aware that we are communicating with each other and we're looking out for the best of all the residents in the county. But I wanted to publicly acknowledge uh, those particular ones, as well as our all of our first responders are there when we need them and, and we <coughs> constantly have those contacts with them. Thank you very much. Uh, Commissioner Marino. Thank you. Um, with the Governor's Hurricane Conference, did, I know it was advertised, but did HOAs attend, did, did representatives of HOAs attend, did they get invitations so they knew about it? We did have some community members, and I just want to tell the, um, share with you a little piece of information that I didn't share, the value of it being here. Um, there are a lot of volunteer opportunities at the Governor's Hurricane Conference. Um, it, it couldn't be done without the volunteers, and I, and I just want to, to give recognition to, to Pat Johnson. She is a CERT team leader, a ham radio operator. She lives in Loxahatchee Groves, and she volunteers in our EOC every single Monday. She actually rallied the troops of 
CERT team members in our county, 60% of the volunteers that served at the Governor's Hurricane Conference were CERT team members right here, members from our community, and they served as room monitors. So what that did for some of the members in our community is they got to sit in the back of the room, um, make sure that the instructor had all the resources they needed, but they were able to attend the Governor's Hurricane Conference free of charge. So. Through that network, we had several um, of our residents from a lot of our communities in attendance at some of these really important training sessions and workshops. Um, but it is, it's, it's very publicly known, the Governor's Hurricane Conference. Anyone can attend, um, but there is a fee, but there are volunteer opportunities that a lot of our residents you know, took advantage of during the conference. That's great, thank you. Um, I did have actually a couple of other things for hurricane preparedness. Um, and I know, and I'm telling these because of ex past experience. Um, if you have medications, make sure you have ice for those medications. A lot of times people forget that. You know, turn off your ice makers, but dump, dump your ice into a container in the freezer. Put, how many plastic containers do we have in our homes? Plastic bins we can fill with water if you don't have a bathtub. Uh, make sure you have propane for your grill if you have a grill. And... I actually used my washing machine, my dryer, and my dishwasher to store valuables in. And, you know, I mean, there was a hurricane a couple of years ago that, that was supposed to hit us directly. And I thought it was going to be the end of the world as we knew it. So I used those three items in my home to store valuables, whether it was documents or something passed down from a grandmother or a grandfather, something of that nature. And I and I had taken all of my plastic containers and I put them on my counter, filled them with water, and took a picture and put it on Facebook saying, you don't have to go buy water. You don't have to use single-use plastic. You can use what you have at home. So just, those are just my thoughts. Thank you very much for listening. That's great. Thank you. And uh, Commissioner Sachs, did you have uh, comments or questions? Thank you. Um, we're all Floridians. I think you become a Floridian when you've gone through one hurricane, right. at least one. There was a year when we had six named storms, and many of these laws that you talked about, uh, Todd and your team, were, uh, were, became in effect. And uh, a lot of them applied. Um, I know Commissioner Marino asked about HOA representatives, but a lot of them applied to uh, HOAs and gas stations, mandatory. Uh, refrigeration and generators to take care of our people and they keep the elevators running as well so I want to thank you Todd and your team for putting this together especially before June 1st when it uh, comes and um, if we could also remind the public of the need to uh, take advantage of the tax-free items that we always have every year for batteries and um, all these things, uh, flashlights, uh, because now is the time to prepare. And uh, with all these new people f coming in, uh, I welcome them to hurricane season because that, that begins your stripes of becoming true Floridian. Thank you for this information. This is invaluable, and I appreciate it very much. And I think the county is way above everybody else in making people aware of what you have to do. And now I know where Commissioner Marino keeps her valuables. <laughs> <laughs> I go over there and check it out, you know? Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner, Thank I just you. want to share, thank you very much for bringing up the tax-free holiday. It actually begins this Saturday and runs through June 10th. So there's a little bit of a, an extended period of time and there's several items within that tax-free holiday that people can purchase for their disaster supply kit. So um, it begins this Saturday. So I encourage everybody to go out and, and shop. Shop. Yeah, that, we, we will share that information on our social media as well. And I also, if I just could take one second, I have a couple of my, my leadership staff here in the room. I just want to point them out. Kenny and John are, are some of the leaders that are at our team in emergency management. And we try to pair up, pair up an emergency management professional with all of our assistant county administrators to ensure that, you know, we know they don't do this every day of the week, so we try to give them as much information on a daily basis as possible. So thank you for the time. Great, thank you. Um, I have a couple questions. And um, so uh, just to help 
uh, the public when, uh, if they are going to go to a pet shelter, special needs shelter, or regular shelter, what should they plan on bringing with them? We encourage individuals to bring their disaster supply kit with them. Although we have the basic necessities in the shelters, individuals still need to bring their own bedding, um, bring their disaster supply kit, you know, bring your, your snack items, your activities for the children, your food supplies. Um, there are items there, but it may not be something that um, would be in somebody's normal diet or maybe not to their preference. Um, so, you know, if you are one that's a nervous eater and likes Oreos when you're um, nervous, you know, bring a pack of Oreos with you. Bring those comfort items, because those are very important. They, they alleviate the stress. And then your pets, um, you need to make sure you, you come prepared. The Animal Care and Control actually runs, Animal Care and Control actually staffs our pet-friendly shelter. They ask those individuals to bring the cage, um, all of their, their leash, their collar, their food supplies, and a supply of water. So um, what you would bring for yourself personally and how you would prepare for yourself personally, you should also prepare prepare for your pets. And then um, special needs shelters, when those individuals are registered there, they need to come along with their caregiver and bring all their medications along with a list of their medications. All of this information is in, in great detail on our website, um, readypbc.com. So I'd really encourage people to take some time and, and definitely go through our website right now um, and just go through there and see what resources and if they need to take things. There's a there's a hurricane guide on our website that people can download with with you know lots of great information within it. Great. Uh, Commissioner Marino, you recognize. Thank you. Can you repeat the phone number you gave us? I, I wrote down five six one sure our, our seven number four two. 712-6400. So the EOC's number is area code 561-712-6400. Um, and that is also our emergency information center. When we activate the EOC, that turns into the main number for our call center. So individuals can write that number down and have it available to them, you know, before, during, and, and after a storm, that number will be answered. And that's also the number they call to pre-register. Correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And a uh, couple other things. I, when I attended the uh, the uh, uh, hurricane gov the governor's hurricane conference, one of the uh, areas that was discussed so was carbon monoxide uh, and people placing their generators too close to their homes or and you know windows or doors that then infiltrates into their homes and, and people end up with carbon monoxide poisoning and, and can be very dangerous. So making sure it's done in a, a very well ventilated place, which is sort of counterintuitive. People wanna keep their generators covered and you know, but on the other hand, they need to be well away from there because uh, obviously it's, it's dangerous. I did also, uh, I, w I have to say, I went to uh, the same uh, time as the governor's hurricane conference was going on. There was a, the Gold Coast Builders uh, had a, an event themselves on planning uh, for um, disasters. And, you know, one of the things they said, the biggest loss after a disaster uh, was uh, in the area of IT, information technology, uh, computers, and the data that they contained and that people not taking the proper steps to both protect their equipment and... Uh, and to uh, make sure they uh, move the important data to places that are, that are gonna be safe, so. And then I guess the last thing I heard at the conference was uh, hope is not a plan, and we can, I guess, add luck and hope is not a plan. So um, I really appreciate uh, the information being uh, shared today. Does anyone else have any questions? I don't think we have any cards, um, so. All right, um, with that, um, I think we've covered uh, our workshop item for this morning. Thank you all for being here and, and not only the work uh, you're doing uh, for us uh, uh, in helping us prepare, but the work you all do every day to keep, keep us safe and uh, from these kinds, of, or all the different kinds of uh, potential impacts that you uh, show, have shown us earlier. Um, I will allow uh, or ask if there's any comments, if anybody has any final comments, or we'll start with uh, Commissioner Sachs. 
Do you have anything? Um, Stay safe and go shop. We're going to all become, uh, get our stripes as Floridians very soon. I think that uh, regardless of what they say about the number of hurricanes and disasters, we're ready. Uh, we're ready. And, uh, uh, and thank you for helping us to stay ready. And I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kerner. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I know we have a world-class emergency operations center and uh, public safety department, and I'm very thankful for the update and for the service of everyone involved. Uh, on behalf of Commissioner McKinley, I've been asked to request an off-site proclamation uh, for June 3rd as Gun Violence Awareness Day. And we have a second from Commissioner Sachs. All in favor? Yep. All opposed? So that will pass now uh, four to zero uh, with uh, our colleagues uh, absent. Okay, and then Commissioner Marino. Well, I just wanted to say one of the things I found that was interesting from the um, governor's hurricane conference was that people were getting injured after the hurricane. So the diligence isn't over after the hurricane. You actually have to be more diligent so I just wanted to make sure everybody out there paid attention after the hurricane was over. You, got, you need to be aware of the environment around you and be safe. And that's it, thank you. Okay, thank you. And oh, I see Commissioner Sachs has a... Thank you, Mayor. Um, I wanna remind everybody that June 2nd is our economic summit. We are looking forward to it because we're gonna showcase what a world-class county Palm Beach is. We are a premier county and our economy is on its way. Um, I realize that we all know this here, but it's gonna be broadcast not only throughout this county, 60, uh, 66 other counties uh, and, um, and globally, because this is a paradise um, and we are taking this paradise on the next step forward uh, into the 21st century. So we're very excited about that. I want everybody who's listening to this to mark their calendars for June 2nd, Economic Summit, Palm Beach County Convention Center. See you there. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you very much. And uh, seeing no other comments, um, then we will uh, call this meeting adjourned or workshop. <laughs>